365 clips so far this year. He has given up 31 hits in 19 in the third inning. And that's how many runs have been scored for him. 31 runs, obviously the the most runs scored for a San Diego pitcher this year. That's why he can afford that high ERA and a good one loss record. Lineup for the Mets, Vince Coleman leading it off, the center fielder, followed by Tommy Herr, the second baseman. Greg Jeffries, his second start since being disabled, he'll bet third and play third. Right fielder Hubie Brooks hitting fourth. Howard Johnson's had a terrific road trip, two home runs in his last two ball games. He'll bet fifth. Kevin McReynolds in left field hitting sixth. Tim Tuffle will start at first base this evening. Dave Magadan being given the night off. He's in a dreadful slump. Rick Cerrone, the catcher, batting eight. Wally Whitehurst, the pitcher, hitting ninth. And the defense for the Padres. Thomas Howard in left field, in center field, Bip Roberts, and in right field, Tony Gwynn. At third base, Scott Colbo. At shortstop is Tony Fernandez. At second base, Paul Ferris. And at first base is McGriff. Santiago, the catcher, the umpires for the game. Jim Quick behind home plate. Tom Halley in the umpire at first base. Gary Darling, the umpire at second. And Doug Harvey, the umpire at third base. And the first pitch of the ball game. It is in there for a call strike. Vince Coleman leading off for the Mets, hitting 225 for the year. He has no home runs, six runs batted in. It is on base percentage, 338, which is low for a leadoff batter, but he does lead the league in stolen bases with 20. He leads the major leagues, as a matter of fact. And that pitch, a off speed pitch in the count one and one. Coleman, three for four lifetime against. Eric Nolte, who is fighting for his job here with the San Diego Padres, and the fastball line foul back in the stands. But not his life, as we see the opening. No, let's, let's think hope not. <laughs> Although his boss seems to think so, <laughs> yeah. so maybe it is. One ball, two strikes to count. And this ball hit in the air to shallow center field, coming hard to center fielder. Biff Roberts, he tries to make the sliding catch underneath the ball and doesn't come up with it. And Coleman is on. So Biff Roberts playing his second game in center field this year. He had been moved from second base to center field and unable to come up with this one. You can see Biff Roberts sliding prematurely the ball on the outside corner off the end of the bat and Roberts slides and can't come up with it. The ball hitting in front of him. The reason outfielders slide like that is to avoid injuries and when you do slide your gloves down there and usually they try to catch that ball right off the grass but Roberts unable to do that. So Coleman the runner at first base and he is the threat to steal. Tommy heard the batter Coleman draws a throw. Benito Santiago the catcher with probably the best arm in baseball and certainly one of the great arms throwing arms that has ever hit the major league scene. He throws so many times from his knees and makes tremendous throws without even coming up to make the throw. And there's a pitch low for a ball. Tommy here hitting 220 for the year, one home run, 10 runs batted in. He has had the only four hit game for a New York Mets player this year. That was against the Giants on this road trip. Coleman a rather short lead and he takes that as her takes that pitch for a called strike. Tommy Hurd tied for the league lead and walks with 23. This game scheduled to start at 7 o'clock but moved back a half hour. So if you're wondering why we were on the air a half hour later than the old time schedule, that is the reason why. Padres have won two of the three games with the Mets. There goes Coleman, a tremendous jump, but the ball is fouled off to the right side. Coleman had about a six 
six-step running lead as he takes off for second base, but the foul ball will send him back. And if you're wondering why Tommy Herr wasn't taking, Buddy Harrelson will use variations with Coleman at first base. That was a hit and run play. Tommy Herr also taking up to one strike. You can understand that, but when it's two strikes, you don't want to take that, that deep in the count or up to that deep in the count. So the count on Tommy Herr one and two. And this pitch is hit down the right field side in foul territory again Coleman with a big jump and all the way down to second but the ball again fouled off. Big jump. I'll say he had a big jump. It was so big he was on second base and I don't think he would have made it back. As a matter of fact had that ball been caught Vince Coleman in returning to first base failed to touch second. See he didn't look base stealers don't look and when that happens you are at the mercy of the shortstop or second baseman. See there's no look toward the batter so when the ball's hit Coleman doesn't know where it is and Tony Fernandez is not going to help him. Look at Tony. No help at all from any of those infielders. They'll tell you everything but what is right. Yeah right. They'll act like there's a play on you at second or look somewhere else. But they're not going to help you out. Well, on the last two pitches, Coleman with tremendous jumps at first. Nolte should pay a little more attention. Again, he gets a good jump, but the ball goes on through, and Coleman will have a stolen base as the ball was not even handled by Santiago. So Coleman gets his 21st. That ball, one of those patented 55-foot breaking balls that drives catchers crazy. I think what happens to young pitchers, they grip that ball too tightly. And there it is right there. Santiago doesn't stay down on it. Mike Rourke, the pitching coach, out to talk to the young left-hander, Eric Nolte, as Vince Coleman steals his 21st base of the year. And you can see there he got absolutely no help from Fernandez as shortstop even though that ball was not in play it had gone by the catcher Fernandez did not tell him to stand up. If he did you wouldn't believe him anyway. That's right. <laughs> so Tommy Hur with a count of two and two and the Mets with a runner at second with no one out. We're just underway here in San Diego and her hits it out to right field. It's deep enough to get Coleman over to third. Tony Gwynn makes the catch and Coleman to third base with no problem at all. Well that's a fine at bat by Tommy Herr. Fouling off some tough pitches with Coleman running and then with two strikes still with the ability to move Coleman to third base. That's what the Mets need to do. They need to score cheap runs. You can't live and die on that home run, especially now with the absence of Daryl Strawberry. So you have to do things like move runners across and score them when they're at third and less than two outs, two out base hits, things of that nature. And that'll bring up Greg Jeffries, the Padres playing their first baseman and third baseman in for a play at the plate, the shortstop and second baseman back. Jeffries hitting 196 and he takes the pitch for ball one. Jeffries with just 11 hits so far coming off the DL. He has no home runs this year with eight runs betted in and the shortstop and second baseman deep in another conference on the mound. Santiago was just told something from the dugout and what it probably was was to tell Eric Nolte to pitch from the stretch if he wanted to but evidently he doesn't want to he's still winding up could drive a, a pitcher crazy with Coleman at third base and this ball chopped out to the shortstop it'll score a run the throw without in time and Jeffries beats it out as on the play pole ball hoping to get to it and not able to do so and then the throw from deep short by Fernandez not in time. Well, again, the at bat by Tommy Herr with Coleman at third, the third baseman's in tight. Had he been back, Cool Ball makes the play and throws Jeffries out. So Tommy Herr moving Coleman to third, all sorts of things can happen when you make productive outs. And that's what Herr did. That allowed Coleman to score and Jeffries to be on first with an infield hit. Now 
Now nah, Jeffries at first base with one away and the bat is Hubie Brooks. And the first base to Hubie is taken high. Fastball for ball one. Brooks hitting 242 with four home runs, nine runs batted in. In his last four ball games, he's hitting 412 with seven hits and 17 at bats, including the home run. And the 1 0 pitch to Brooks taken for ball two. Two balls, no strikes. We were kidding about Eric Nolte uh, pitching as though his life depended on it. Joe McElvain. Well, Nolte last year had such a bad year, 2 and 11 at Las Vegas. And the ball fouled away. It was such a bad year that after the season was over, he took the written exam to become a Los Angeles uh, an LAPD policeman. Policeman, yes. Yeah. And he passed it. So he's already planning his backup, but then he makes the Padres this spring. I don't know if I'd be. Oh, he picked him off. Jeffries moving on down to second and thrown out on the pickoff play as McGriff gets it to Fernandez in time. McGriff going toward the mound and then throwing to Tony Fernandez. They were teammates at Toronto in Toronto. Jeffries picked off easily by Nolte. He's a dead duck at, at second. I don't know if I, I would be planning my future after baseball when you're that young and you're, and you're playing it. I mean, that allows you some place to light, doesn't it? In case you don't make, make the team. <laughs> He's really thinking ahead. <laughs> it might be it might be closer than he wants though. And the pitch back is taken inside so they count three and oh got off to a great start this year won his first three decisions beat the Dodgers twice San Francisco once. And he hasn't won since his last win was on April 23rd and this is his first game start. In 10 days, and that pitch fouled away, so the count at three and two. He's had one game start against the Mets. That was back on August 23rd, 1987, at Shea Stadium. Was the losing pitcher when the Mets defeated the Padres nine to two. He worked six innings. And another one hit deep, but foul way back there. Ball hit far enough to be out of the ballpark, but foul by about 25 or 30 feet. So Brooks with a count staying at three balls and two strikes. And again the three two pitch and it's hit hard to the shortstop Fernandez and for the first base will retire the side but the Mets get one. They had two hits, no one left on base. The score at the end of one half inning, the Mets won. The Padres coming up, and here's a word from WNEW FM. Take the field, and on the mound for the Mets will be Wally Whitehurst with a record of one win and one loss, an earned run average of 3.13. This will be his seventh game of the year, his fourth game start. He's worked 23 innings. And he has a lifetime record against the Padres of 0 and 1. The lineup for San Diego: Bip Roberts leading it off the center fielder, shortstop Tony Fernandez batting second, and Tony Gwynn, the right fielder, what a hitter he is. He'll bat third. Fred McGriff off to a torrid start, hitting fourth. Benito Santiago, the catcher, hitting fifth. Thomas Howard in left field, batting sixth. Scott Coolbaugh, the third baseman, batting seventh. Paul Ferries, the second baseman, hitting eighth, and Eric Nolte. The pitcher slated to bat ninth. And the first pitch to Biff Roberts fouled back out of play. Roberts, one of the best kept secrets in the National League. Batted 309 for the Padres last year with nine home runs. This year hitting 275. He has no home runs. He's driven in eight. And he bounces this one to the shortstop. Johnson will have to hurry. He does. And Roberts is out. The defense for the Mets in the outfield McReynolds in left Coleman in center and Brooks in right 
In the infield, Jeffries at third, Johnson at shortstop, Hur at, sh at second, and Tim Tuffle playing in place of Magadan at first base. The catcher, Rick Saron, and Wally Whitehurst, the pitcher. That'll bring up Tony Fernandez hitting 241, no home runs, nine runs batted in. Fernandez last year with the Blue Jays hit 276 with four home runs, 66 RBIs. He led the major leagues in three base hits with 17, and he takes the first pitch for a call strike. Those 17 three base hits, the most in the major leagues since Willie Wilson hit 21 back in 1985. He has some competition for leading the National League in three base hits from Tony Gwynn, who currently is the leader in the National League this year. And that pitch, a ball that's one and one. Ollie Whitehurst with a lifetime record of two and two. And this one hit fouled on the left side. It'll be out of play. Speaking of the three base hits, three players have hit more than 19 over the last 40 years. Wilson, George Brett, and Willie Mays. Triples are fine too. You should know you led the league in three base hits one year. How many did you hit? Hit 13. 13. There's a fastball. Fouled off one and two. Not many catchers have done that. Nope. Don't believe any. Yeah, you know, of course that was the first year in Bush Stadium too, and you had those uh, those alleys in right center and left center. If you if you could find the alley and hit it hard enough, well. Of course, that was before uh, artificial surface was put in at Bush Stadium, but the ball really, really carried to the wall, and if you hit it, you could run all day. And the breaking ball, and Fernandez is struck out. You see more hitters not able to adjust on that type of breaking ball. That's a breaking ball that's too high. You never, you never see this pitch hit. Watch how high it is. You often see it lifted the other way. That, the hanger is about thigh high. That ball is about letter high, right below the letters. And Fernandez down on strikes. That's a very difficult pitch to, to throw because you, that's not where it's designed to be thrown up. And there's a man up there who is one of the toughest to strike out in baseball and it's Tony Gwynn he takes the first pitch for ball one Gwynn hitting 325 fifth in the National League one home run 20 runs better than a home run in last night's ball game and he fouls off the fastball Tony's up in the batter's box this year look how I mean when he strides he's almost in fair territory one of the good reasons for hitting up in the batter's box you get the curveball before it breaks down out of the strike zone Don't see many hitters that far forward in the box, and that ball topped out to the shortstop, fielded there by Howard Johnson, and the out of first base retires the side. So the Padres go in order. The score at the end of one. The Mets won. The Padres nothing. And here's a word from nobody beats the Wiz. Second inning, the Mets leading one nothing with a quick run in the first on a blue base hit by Coleman, a stolen base. A fly ball to right field to move Coleman over to third, and Coleman scored on an infield base hit by Jeffries. And here in the second, it'll be Howard Johnson to lead it off. Johnson hitting 240 in the year with eight home runs, 24 runs batted in. Tied for third in home runs, tied for second in runs batted in, and tied for fourth in extra base hits. And the first pitch by Eric Nolte, a fastball fouled back out of play. As Tim pointed out, Johnson red hot in his last 25 ball games, he has had eight home runs and 24 runs batted in. One strike to count. One and one. Johnson, a switch hitter. Yeah. 
And this pitch hit in the air to deep left field going back as Howard to the wall. He's there and he will make the play. So Howard Johnson a sky high deep fly ball for the out. A lot of people talk about baseball being a game of inches. They say that about a lot of sports. Well, in no other department is baseball a game of inches than in hitting. Howard with that ball just off the barrel of the bat. And I mean, he just missed hitting that ball a ton. So uh, another red bat, no matter how you hit it. Yeah. But it does make you feel good when you hit the ball well when you're at that plate. And here's a man, Kevin McReynolds, who has been struggling throughout this year. Yeah, all you can do is hit it hard. Put a solid swing on it. That's all. And that pitch called a strike. It's one and one. McReynolds hitting 207. One home run, six runs batted in. Started his major league career here with the San Diego Padres. That's a good breaking ball. You know, it's in, I was talking to Dave Magadan. Dave was sitting out tonight's game, and he was telling me that, you know, we talked in Sunday's game about how he's in between. He said, boy, that is exactly right. He said, I'm trying to guide the ball. I'm not swinging. Uh, he said he, he thought he ought to get back to the old theory about hit, see the ball and hit it. And McReynolds pulled completely on the curveball. And Noldy records his first strikeout. Sometimes you, as a hitter, you, you think too much up there. And, you know, naturally your preparation is to think about what the pitcher has, what he's going to throw. But sometimes getting back to that. And you can see Kevin McReynolds shaking his head and scratching his head. He is really off to a slow start this year. So two away and Tim Temple the batter is also off to a very slow start. Tim has had just two hits and 20 at bats. This is his third game start at first base. Hitting 095. And that pitch is strike. That's the old story about do you hold the trademark up when you hit. And the answer is I don't know. I didn't come up here to read. Yeah. And here's the pitch back and Tuffle goes after the pitch tries to hold up and gets credit for not swinging as first base umpire Tom Hallion said he didn't that go around. Yeah, I think Tim got away with one right there. One ball one strike Tuffle probably guesses more than anybody on the Mets team and if he guesses wrong he has a lot of those half swings. This ball grounded to shortstop. Fernandez, the best fielding shortstop in the history of Major League Baseball, throws him out. A one, two, three inning for Eric Nolte, and the score at the end of one and a half innings. It is the Mets one, the Padres nothing. Now, here's a word from the New York Daily News. Some of the second, the Mets leading one nothing. In games that the Mets have scored the first run of the ball game, they have a record of 12 wins and five losses. The Mets are two games back of the Pirates at the start of the action here tonight in San Diego, with a record of 17 and 13. And the Padres, two games back of the Atlanta Braves at the start of the action today, with a record of 16 and 16. And the first pitch to Fred McGriff is taken for ball one. McGriff just tearing up the National League. Number one in on base average at 464, slugging at 655, total bases at 74, extra base hits with 15, and walks with 23. And this time they get him out as he grounds out softly to first base. Tommy Herr. And it's one away. Griff hitting 354 before the out, second in the National League in hitting. And then I'll bring up Benito Santiago. Remember, drinking responsibly makes good sense. Please know when to say when. A reminder from Budweiser. Santiago hitting 262. He has four home runs, 18 runs batted in. Rookie of the year in 1987 when he batted 300 and hit in 34 consecutive games. The longest hitting streak by a rookie in the history of the game, and he takes a strike. Santiago played left field the other day and it was a switch by 
the manager Greg Griddock there was a mistake and he had to play Santiago in the outfield. Miscalculation on the lineup cards and this pitch fouled off a good fastball strike two. First time he's ever played left field. I wonder if he throws from his knees out in left field. <laughs> he does when he catches it. He makes those great throws. Yeah, he is just, it's not fair to have that good an arm. See an outfielder go out, catch the ball, drop to his knees, and throw it in. <laughs> Curveball missing, one ball, two strikes. Tell you another guy who throws from his knees, Sandy Alomar Jr. He's a catcher for Cleveland, rookie of the year last year. So the Padres have developed two fine catchers in the last five years. And there's a good fastball for a call, strike three. Second strikeout for Whitehurst. Last year, the All Star game, as a matter of fact, could have featured two guys from the same organization facing each other. Santiago had the broken wrist. He broke it when Jeff Brantley hit him with the pitch. Brantley, the short reliever for the Giants. Sandy Alomar Jr. was the starting catcher for the American League, so it could have been Santiago and and Sandy Alomar Jr. And the Alomar is certainly in the record book. Roberto Alomar, the second baseman, made the last out in Ryan's seventh no hitter, and he also broke up Ryan's bid for a back-to-back -back no hitter with a base hit. Next time that they faced, yeah, each but other. I mean, yeah, bid. I mean, that's like saying every pitcher has a bid. For a no hitter every time they go out there. I, I just could not believe, I couldn't believe, and we'll say it again, how the press and nationally were talking about how he's buying to pitch a second no hitter. I mean, the odds against that are astronomical. Well, Howard gets his base hit. He's now three for 11 on the year, just brought up from the minor leagues, and that puts a runner on. First hit given up by Whitehurst, and it brings up. Scott Coolball. Coolball hitting 300. Three hits and 10 advance. Mets leading 1 0. Speaking of Nolan Ryan with the Texas Rangers, that's where Scott Coolball came from. Came over from Mark Parent. And then he was sent to. Las Vegas, the Triple A affiliate of the Padres, the Las Vegas Stars. And recalled when Marty Barrett was put on the disabled list. Howard, big jump running with a pitch, a throw by Sorrell, not in time, and Howard gets a stolen base. He did have a big jump, didn't wow. he? Wow. Sarone has done a fine job, six of nine from behind home plate that he has nailed. He had no chance on this one. That's what often happens. A catcher tries to hurry the throw and, and throws it in the dirt. Howard's first stolen base, that puts the time run at second with Tumit out. And they count 1-0 and oh on Coolball. And Whitehurst with a fastball, two balls, no strikes. Scott Coolball, one of many major league players attending the University of Texas. Signed by the Rangers as a third round selection in the June 1987 draft. That's ball three, three balls, no strikes. Paul Ferries, the on deck batter. Cool ball lives in San Antonio, Texas. Graduated from Roosevelt High School in San Antonio, then attended the University of Texas. 3 0 pitch and a strike. Three and one the count.
balmy night here in San Diego. Mets losing the first game last night. Another game to play tomorrow afternoon. The 3 1 pitch. Again, a good fastball for a strike, and it's 3 and 2. There's got to be good movement on that Whitehurst fastball. When big league hitters are looking for the fastball and they're frozen by it, then the movement is really deceptive. That ball tailing back over the outside corner. Three and two of the count. And the pitch grounded up the middle, and that will tie up the ball game. Howard comes in to score, and it's all tied at one. Scott Coolball getting the bad head out in front. And he hits it hard through the middle. Howard Johnson with no play on it. And the Padres have tied it. And that'll bring up Paul Ferries, the second baseman, hitting 192. Padres going for their younger ball players. Ferries with five hits and 26 at bats. And he takes ball one. We mentioned Cool Ball, a product of the University of Texas. Well, Paul Ferries was a teammate of the Mets' Doug Simons at Pepperdine University. Also, another Pepperdine, Pepperdine grad is the first base coach for the Padres, Rob Pichelo. One ball, no strikes, and a swing and a foul tip. One and one, and Cerrone hit by that foul tip, trying to shake it off. Hey, when announcers used to do ball games 30 years ago, I bet you didn't have all the talk about guys going to college and what college they attended. Take one more look at, at this ball that hits Rick Cerrone. It looked like his right thigh that was nailed. Not too many college graduates 30 years ago. Dick Grote comes to mind. Vic Janowitz. And let's go back to Frankie Fresh of Ford and Flash. Mm -hmm. Few of them. Robin Roberts went to Michigan State. And this ball grounded foul on the third base side. But nowadays the college is really used almost for schooling and minor league play. A lot of players out of high school not recognized as top draft choices, so they go to college hoping they'll improve and then get bigger money to sign. Of course, the college programs are so much better in baseball than they used to be, and you have junior college programs that are also excellent. Florida, Texas, and California predominant in that market. Arizona State. Arizona. Florida State. And plus, 50 years ago, baseball players were not looked upon as being the highest class of society. <laughs> <laughs> now wait a minute, you almost you almost got back to me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean that's true though, right? I mean the reputation of baseball players 50, 60 years ago was not real good. That is true. And that pitch fouled away. I know my mother didn't want me to be a ball player. Said you better go to school and be a lawyer or somebody reputable. You don't want to let your son grow up to be cowboys. That's either. right, you can't do that. <laughs> One and two the count as Paul Ferry's bats. Runner at first base, ball game tied at one. We're in the bottom half of the second inning. Coming your way from San Diego, California. And a ball call, so it's two and two. Padres having lost five in a row, broke that losing streak with a win last night. On this homestand, they are two and five. But they still are in the race. They're two games back of Atlanta, game back of the Dodgers, tied with the Cincinnati Reds. And here's the pitch. In the dirt, it bounces away, and 
Cool ball goes down the second on the wild pitch. Sometimes pitchers will throw two breaking balls in a row because if they miss with the first one, they adjust on the second one. But Whitehurst throwing two in a row through the second breaking ball worse than the first one, and it scoots by Cerrone. That's often good policy for, for a young pitcher. If you're a catcher, an experienced catcher, call the two curveballs in a row because they will adjust on the pitch. Hitters adjust, but so do pitchers. And the 3-2 pitch on the way. It's ball four. That puts runners at first and second and brings up the pitcher. First walk issued by Whitehurst. And Eric Noldy the batter. Noldy with a base hit and eight at bats. Hitting 125 on the year. Padres with a run in with two men out, a single by Howard. Howard then stole second and scored in a single by Coolball. Coolball moved to second on a wild pitch and Ferry's walking behind him and the pitch on the outside corner fastball. McReynolds an awfully deep left field against the left handed hitting pitcher. Just thinking the same thing. Runner at second base you got to try and be shallow enough to throw him out at the plate with a pitcher hitting and here's the pitch and it's taken. One ball one strike. If you're an opposite fielder you try to position yourself where the hitter can't drive a ball over your head. If it's a fly ball over your head the loft of the ball gives you a chance to go back to get it. But McReynolds entirely too deep right now. Deeper than the center fielder and the right fielder, and this is a left-hand batter. And right. That's a pitch for a strike, and it's one and two. Left-handed batter and a left-handed hitting pitcher. There's the outfield alignment. Wally Whitehurst on the mound. And he goes to the breaking ball. Good play on it by Cerrone to keep it right there. And it's two and two. Swing and a miss, the ball not held on to by Cerrone, so he has to complete the strikeout at first base. One run to tie on two hits, two left, and the score at the end of two. The Padres won, the Mets won, and here's a word from British Airways. Carlsbad, California loves the Mets. Carlsbad, just about 25 miles north of San Diego. As we go to the top of the third, it's one to one. Rick Summerum will lead it off for the Mets. Rick hitting 304 in the year with one home run, seven runs batted in. Eric Noldy, the pitcher, and the first pitch a curveball for ball one. Cerrone earlier this year hit in his first 10 ball games, hitting 394 over the 10 games, the longest hitting streak by a Mets player this season. This ball hit in the air to left field. Howard breaks back and now comes in and he makes the catch. So one away in the third, one one game. Out of night, pitcher number 47, Wally Whitehurst. I'm to bring up Wally Whitehurst. Wally one for four in the year. The first pitch he called strike. Strike two. The Mets against left hand pitching with a record of eight wins and eight losses this season. 
foul ball keeps the count at two strikes. Wally's average at 250. And that one the ball. His one base hit was a two base hit. One for four. Struck him out. Macy's National League scoreboard shows Atlanta losing to the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field. So Five to four. Cincinnati over St. Louis 3 to 1 in the ninth. Pittsburgh over Houston 6 to 2 in the eighth inning. L.A. about 100 miles north of here over the Montreal Expos. 1 to nothing. And Philadelphia playing good ball. Even without Dykstra and Dalton, they lead San Francisco 1 to nothing. Boy, the Giants are really struggling. And the batter now is Vince Coleman. Coleman takes the strike. Coleman with a blue base at the center scored the only run for the Mets. It's tied at one. After the single, he stole second, went to third base on a fly ball to right by Tommy Hur and scored on an infield base hit. And now he gets his second hit of the ball game. And again, a threat to steal. Before the ball game this evening, Bobby Beffitt, the general manager of the San Diego Chargers, was down in the clubhouse. Interesting story. When Bethard was the general manager of the Washington Redskins back in 1982, he visited the campus of Florida A&M, and Vince Coleman was in his senior year. And Coleman broke his ankle. Had Coleman not broken his ankle, he was giving serious thought to playing with the Washington Redskins. A relationship between him and Bethard was developed, and they're still friends. And Bethard came down there tonight, and he said, Vincent, same deal applies if you ever want to give up baseball and go into football. Now, you think if Vince Coleman making 12 million bucks over four years is going to go into football now? Not a chance. Not in his right mind. No. He was no a way. kicker in football and an outstanding one. They wanted to make a wide receiver out of him, and with his speed, you can understand why. Coleman chased back at first. Coleman leads the major leagues with 21 stolen bases, counting the one here tonight. Tommy Hurd taking that first pitch to allow Coleman to run, but Coleman did not go. So they can't strike one on her. And a pitch out. Not a good one either. One ball, one strike. Buddy Harrelson is in his first full year as the manager of the Mets, and Greg Riddick is in his first full year as manager of the Padres. Talked about college the last inning. Riddick, a very intelligent man, graduated from Colorado State, grew up in Southern California, but was born in Greeley, Colorado, and got his bachelor's of business degree and taught psychology for 13 years in high school as a substitute teacher still does it looks like a college professor yeah and he talks like he's a very very bright guy a very compassionate man a very uh, warm personality Two and one the count on Tommy Hur. A good running situation here for Vince Coleman. Look for him to be running here. And he goes. The ball hit down the right field line and it's foul. So Coleman again with a good jump. And back to first. It's been either good or bad for an oldie on base runners. Coleman stole on him in the first. He then picked Jeffries off at first. Coleman seems to be reading him very well. He's had big jumps on him three times. Make it four times. Nolte's tried to combat that with that slide step where pitchers slide toward home. They don't pick the foot up. 
when you slide toward home you do lose power you don't throw the ball as hard as you would if you pick the leg up that leg kick generates power and the 2 2 pitch outside and now Coleman will be running with the pitch with the full count two men away a lot of teams would play the first baseman behind the runner but if the Padres did that that would give Coleman an extra chance I think you ought to hold a guy like Coleman on right now they're going to play behind but I think if you if you hold him on otherwise Coleman scores on a short double long single with his speed now he does go and the ball hit up the middle it's a single to center field Coleman will easily get to third base he goes to third makes the turn and holds there as they get the ball back in in a hurry so Tommy Hur with a single and the mess now with runners at first and third You saw the jump that Coleman had. Fortunately for the Padres, Her hits it to a straightaway position. And Bip Roberts has no problem holding Coleman to third base. But if that ball on a short double long single type of hit in a gap, if you don't hold Coleman on there, he could have scored. Now Jeffrey's a batter, and Greg with his first pitch, a breaking ball inside for ball one. Jeffrey's an infield base hitter and a run batted in his first time up. Now has nine RBIs in the year. One one game, the Mets with runners at first and third. And it's ball two. Two balls, no strikes. Mike Rourke, the pitching coach for the Padres, formerly the pitching coach under Whitey Herzog's St. Louis Cardinals for the majority of the 80s. the advice has been passed on the count two balls no strikes as Eric Nor Nolte works to Greg Jeffries and a breaking ball in for a called strike two and one Fernandez the shortstop for San Diego shaded over in the hole and again the breaking ball so it goes to a 3 1 count playing the count you see Fernandez over toward the hole if there were two strikes he'd be a step to his left step or two but since it's three and one he's over near the hole chance of Jeffrey's pulling it greater and it's ball four and that will load up the bases. First walk and it loads up the bases. Coleman at third base, hers at second, and Jeffries at first. And the batter for the Mets, Hubie Brooks. Hubie grounded out his first time up with the ball sharply to the shortstop Fernandez. And the first pitch for ball one, a fastball too high. Oh boy. Nolte's flirting with danger here. Brooks with no grand slammers last year after having won for six consecutive years. And a strike off. He had to have that strike there to even the count. If he goes 2-0 oh to Brooks, he'll be Brooks a notorious hitter, not only with two outs and runners in scoring position, but when he's ahead in the count, he guesses right. He's strong enough to pop it out of here. Good pitch by Noldy there, breaking ball with the count one and zero, and there's another one. So Noldy with two good pitches in the clutch, under the gun. Now Brooks will change his hitting strategy and go for contact rather than for the long ball here. He normally does that very well. The one two pitch and it's contacted but hit to the right side so the count will stay at one and two. 
Doobie with two strikes really goes to the contact and tries to hit the ball toward the right side of the field. By doing so, he stays in there longer, and it's a good idea against breaking balls. And again, the one-two pitch almost thrown away as Santiago dies out to make the play. Good play by Santiago. He wanted it away, but not that far away. And the 2-2 pitch hit to deep left center. It's going, going, and it is gone. Goodbye. A grand slam home run by Hubie Brooks. count Hubie Brooks got the fastball he was looking for and I mean he hits it like a shot that's his seventh career grand slam home run and we mentioned last year when a pitcher a young pitcher like that struggles with his control and gets a guy like Hubie Brooks well I mean he crushed that ball too no doubt about it, and the Mets taking the lead now by a score of five to one with Howard Johnson the batter, and that's ball two. So it's two and all to Howard Johnson. Howard played the deep left his first time up. I said the previous he didn't have a grand slammer last year, but he had won the last six years. That's what I said. I was wrong. It was the last five years. He had one in 85, 6, 7, 8, and 9. None last year. And now one this year. Well, he got the fastball he was looking for, and I mean, just, there's nothing left, QB. Just trot <laughs> now. You don't have to run. You don't have to look. Uh-uh. <laughs> and the pitch back a ball, so it goes to 3 and 1 to Howard Johnson, and Oldie obviously shaken up. these runs coming with two men out and ball four so Johnson walks the second walk in this inning now Nolte was almost out of it he made the pitch as you said Ralph on the 1 0 count the curve ball and then he threw another good curve ball to run the count to one and two but now he evens the count with that with that fastball on which Santiago dived for outside. And then he had to come back in. You don't want to run the count to 3 2, but Hubie looking for that pitch and finally got it. And he didn't miss it. In 21 innings now, Nolte has given up a total of six home runs. And that pitch is strike to Kevin McReynolds, his first strikeout victim. Rodriguez throwing in the bullpen for San Diego. Just starting the throw. Two strikes the count to McReynolds. McReynolds hitting 207 coming into this game with one home run, six runs batted in. Johnson is short lead at first. And he's running, and the pitch is to end the dirt and gets by Santiago. So Johnson will get a stolen base as Nolte's having all kinds of problems right now. Well, this has got to be a tough thing for a manager and a pitcher, obviously. I mean, Greg Reddick trying to get Nolte on track, trying to give him every opportunity. Now, after that home run, he appears like his confidence is really shaken. Ojo sliding into second easily. No play. One ball, two strikes, and there's a line drive base to 
Base hit to center field. McReynolds coming around. He'll score. Ball cut off. And the Mets now have their fifth run in the inning as they lead it by a score of six to one. It's just a matter of whether Rich Rodriguez can get ready quickly enough. I think that's going to be all for Eric Nolte. Yep. Here comes Riddick. Well, Nolte started off well. He got the first two batters and then a single by Coleman, a single by Tommy Hur. A walk to load the bases, the grand slam home run by Hubie Brooks, the walk to Johnson, the stolen base, and then the single by McReynolds and Noldy out of the ball game. And this call to the bullpen is brought to you by New York Telephone, who reminds you that we're all connected. Identical to last year's numbers, one and one last year with the Padres, even though he started off the season with Las Vegas, and he's one and one this year. Originally with the New York Mets, traded to the Padres for infielder Brad Pounders. He was first drafted by Kansas City in the 17th round of the June 1981 draft, but didn't sign. And the Mets drafted him in the sixth round of the June draft in 1984 and was traded to the Padres. And his first pitch is strike as he works to Tim Tuffle. Tuffle grounded out his first time up. McReynolds, the runner at first base. Tuffle, two for 22 so far this year, playing first base today. And a pitch for a ball, it's one and one. Tuffle replacing Magadan at first. Magadan with a bruised shoulder, but actually able to play. Giving Tuffle a chance to get into the lineup as you look at Dave Magadan working on the bubble gun. One ball, one strike, and the pitch to Tuffle hit hard to left field. Off and running is Howard, and he's over there to make a fine running play to end the inning. But the Mets send nine men to the plate as they score five runs. The big hit, the grand slam home run by Hubie Brooks. They leave one in the score at the end of two and a half innings. The Mets six and the Padres one. And here's a word from your tri-state Toyota dealer. Stadium, you could come right in there in that inlet by the airport. Sure, There's a little exactly. place to dock. Wouldn't take that long. No. Migrate north from That's Orlando. I mean, meet a few friends on the way. <laughs> There's Biff Roberts to hit for the second time in this game. The Mets leading six to one. The big blow, the grand slam home run by Hubie Brooks. And Biff, who grounded out his first time up, now has a count of strike two. Roberts, an outstanding young ball player for the San Diego Padres. And a ball call. One ball and two strikes. Curveball gets it. We've looked at the Macy's National League scoreboard. Let's look at the American League scoreboard. California losing to the Yankees. The Yankees have won five of their last six. Boston over Chicago, four to one. Four to one also. Toronto over Kansas City. Two to one. The Seattle Mariners only a game and a half out of first place behind Oakland. Actually a half game now with Oakland losing to Baltimore. Minnesota over Milwaukee five to one and Detroit over Texas one nothing in the third Milwaukee in a horrendous slump. Oh yeah. And Tony Fernandez fouls off his first pitch strike one Fernandez struck out his first time up. I mentioned that Fernandez was the best fielding shortstop in Major League Baseball history that's on stats not possibly on total range and what have you although his range is outstanding but Field, he, fielding percentage fielding right? percentage uh -huh. he's made an average of one error every 51 chances that is better than anyone's ever done fewest errors for the most chances Larry Boa had one in every 49 chances 
Hernandez going through a, a bit of a difficult period going from the artificial surface to to grass. He's made six errors this year. Hops are truer on the rug. And faster. Uh-huh. Gets the ball gets to you faster. You don't have to hurry your throws. One and two the count. This one bounced to the second base side. Tommy Herr, who's not made an error this year, gets his second assist to this ball game. He has not made an error in 126 chances this season. Right fielder, Tony Gwynn. So two men away, and Tony Gwynn the batter. Tony started this year with a lifetime batting average of 329. That's number 12 in the National League in the history of the National League. And he's second among active players with the second best batting average lifetime. Second to Wade Barnes, who has a lifetime average of 346, which is really up there. I think Boggs is fourth all, all time behind Ty Cobb, Cobb Shoeless Joe Jackson. Who am I missing? That's, about, that's pretty close to about it. Yeah, there, there's one more. I think Boggs is fourth. One ball, one strike to Tony Gwynn. Al Simmons is way up there. He's around the 342 mark. Rogers Hornsby is also up there. Might be Hornsby. I think it is Hornsby. Hornsby averaged 400 for five consecutive years in his major league career. That is almost unbelievable, and he was a right-hand batter. Ty Cobb's lifetime average 356, 367, I should say. Then Rogers Hornsby, we got him at 358. Yep. Shula Show Jackson, 356. Actually, fifth because Lefty O'Doul is in there with a 347 lifetime average. So Wade Boggs is fifth in Major League history among players with 2,500 career at bats. So Tony Gwynn single. Excuse me, Ralph. That's one of those patented Tony Gwynn hits. He hits the ball with authority the other way. So Gwynn is on. Mets leading six to one, and Fred McGriff having a sensational year in the National League. First pitch a call strike. McGriff with a 14 game hitting streak that ended on the ninth. Second longest hitting streak in the National League. Butler had a 16 game hitting streak that ended prior to the Mets series. One strike to count. And strike two. You know, the impressive thing about McGriff is with that wide stance, all he does is pick his right foot up and put it down in the same spot. There's no stride. There's a pickup. See that wide stance of McGriff. Now, all, he do, all he'll do on his swing is pick the right foot up and put it back down in the same spot. That way, there's no overstride. And a good curveball. Fifth strikeout for Whitehurst. It ends the inning. One hit, one left. And the score at the end of three. The Mets six. The Padres one. And here's a word from American Express. The Padres hit. This is a mirror image of how Joe DiMaggio would stand without a stride, make his swing. Griff hitting the same way. Obviously, from the left-hand side of the plate, Joe DiMaggio, a right-handed hitter. But DiMaggio never took a stride. Joe DiMaggio, one of the greatest hitters that ever played the game of baseball. Griff, with that type stance. You don't see a lot of that. A lot of hitters hit that way. I hit that way. Also, Gus Erniel hit that way. Vern Stevens hit that way, just to name a few. As we go to the top of the fourth, a man who hit with his bat coiled Stan Musial like Tim McCarver. <laughs> Rick Cerrone is the batter. Going to emulate somebody, you might as well emulate Stan Musial. Mm -hmm. Interesting, too, Tim. Now, Stan, with that coil on the short, 
with his feet close together. They took a long stride. Real long. And he was a great hitter. So there are a lot of ways sure. to hit in this game of baseball. Yeah, you it, don't have to do it one way or the other. Yeah, it doesn't matter really how you start. It's how you approach the ball when it's in that sweet part. And boy, what a sweet hit that was for Rick Cerrone. Swinging bunt down the third baseline. So Cerrone leads off the fourth with a base hit. Right here, Rodriguez comes off the mound, and he has a chance to make the play. Saron obviously doesn't run well, but he can't pick it up. And it is being scored as a base hit. So a good break for Saron as he gets an infield hit. And the Mets have their leadoff batter on again. Wally Whitehurst will be the batter. Rich Rodriguez relieving Eric Nolte in the third inning, an inning in which the Mets scored five runs, highlighted by a grand slam home run by Hubie Brooks his fifth home run of the year and the first grand slam by a Mets player. Cerrone returns to first to count no balls in one strike to Wally Whitehurst. There's Hubie Doobie. Crushing a 2 2 fastball off Eric Nolte. All the runs all five runs in the third coming after two were out. Nolte retired the first two then Coleman singled her singled Jeffries walked. Grand salami for Brooks. Then Howard Johnson walked, stole second. He was driven in by Kevin McReynolds. So the, all the thunder coming with, with two outs. It's no balls and two strikes now to Wally Whitehurst. Six to one, New York on top. Seven hits for the Mets, three for the Padres. And a good bunt, especially with a count 0 and 2. And Rodriguez throws out Whitehurst as Cerrone moves to second base. So the sacrifice successful. And a reminder that this game is brought to you in part by Manufacturers Hanover, where your money has power. And by the United States Postal Service, an official Olympic sponsor. I'm Tim McCarver, along with Ralph Kiner. Happy you've joined us. Nearing the 12 o'clock hour back east. Beautiful San Diego. The color scheme is different also. If you remember in past years, the Padres color scheme of that orange or whatever that color was. And, Adobe and brown. brown, I think it was called. Adobe, Adobe brown. brown. And you can see the color scheme that orange and a navy blue around the stadium certainly a prettier color ball and no strikes to Vince Coleman who's had a good night two for two or two run score stolen base to his credit 21 on the season the original owner of the San Diego Padres was a fellow named C. Arnold Smith a great developer here in San Diego a man who really put San Diego on the map in a way to speak commercially and his favorite color was that Adobe Brown and Got to be kidding me. everything that he owned was Adobe Brown oh but so it sort of goes in the tradition of the Padres uh -huh. the Padres of mm. the of the old old days here mm. breaking ball gets Coleman two outs now first strikeout for Rich Rodriguez Second baseman, Tom Hurd. Well, that color is fine for the good Padres and the good fathers, but for a baseball team. Looks great on a mission. <laughs> <laughs> well, the mission of the Mets fairly successful out here to the West Coast. They won two of three in San Francisco, beating the struggling Giants two of three. And they're leading here after losing last night. By a score of five to two, they lead tonight six to one, and Tommy Hurd takes a strike. And after the Mets leave here, you'll be taking the El Camino Real up to Los Angeles. Right. The trail of Juan Epo Sierra. Sierra, I guess it was. The great missionary established all the missions up the coast here in California. 
why you have names like San Diego, San Francisco, San Clemente, Los Angeles, the city of the angels, Santa Barbara. Santiago, I think, means San Diego, doesn't it? I believe it's something close to that. <laughs> close, close is good enough. That's right? because well, Tijuana's close. I don't know if that's good enough. <laughs> Ground ball left side. And look at Fernandez going to third base to nail Rick Cerrone. Well, we're talking about directions. Why go the long way when you can go the short way? The Mets lead six to one, middle of the fourth. We're back after this from Manufacturers Hanover. <laughs> Fans reading that scoreboard, Hubie Brooks highlighting a five-run third inning with a grand slam home run. Mets scored one in the first, five in the third. San Diego with their lone run coming in the bottom of the second on an RBI single by Scott Coolbaugh, the third baseman. Benito Santiago, a strikeout victim. Wally Whitehurst striking out five tonight, and he is not noted for his strikeouts. He is throwing hard. And a good curveball with it. Yeah. Incidentally, San Diego and San Diego, according to our sources which will be unnamed actually means St. James the two names do mean St. James that's at least according to our <laughs> disclosed source <laughs> easy play for Tuffle now let me get this straight Santiago and San Diego both mean St. James. James is that right yes. okay. you buy that Sure. Okay. Thomas Howard singled and scored the only San Diego run. He also stole a base. Howard on the opening day San Diego roster. He was sent down after one game and then recalled when Mike Aldretti was released on the 10th of May. Strike one. Good curveball misses. One and one. You're watching Mets Baseball 91 on Universal 9, WWOR TV, Secaucus, New Jersey. Ball and two strikes now to the switch hitting Thomas Howard. Well, you mentioned earlier, Ralph, that Wally Whitehurst was two and two for his career. That's only in baseball. Should be three and two because he has won the heart of one Roslyn o Olivier. He is engaged to Roslyn. Think about what a pretty name that's going to be. Roslyn Olivier Whitehurst. It sounds like royalty, doesn't it? They'll be married after the season, I believe. They were engaged in January. Hometown sweetheart from Homa, Louisiana. That's where Wally's from. Roslyn Olivier Whitehurst. Beautiful name. Mm-hmm. Way inside, brushing Howard back away from the plate. Two and two. One out here in the fourth. Six to one, New York. A little fastball in around the thigh high position. Howard shows he can dance. Tim Tuffle. Second put out for Timmy. Unassisted. And that'll bring up Scott Coolball, the third baseman. Third baseman As Howard is retired, Coolball. only three hits for the Padres. We're in the bottom of the fourth, 6 1 New York. Who 
ball stock was a little higher a couple of years ago with the Rangers. Matter of fact, there was talk about him going to the Chicago Cubs when the Cubs had third base with third base problems. And that trade, of course, was never made. So Kubal was traded for Mark Parent, the catcher that went over to, to Texas. And the Cubs have, at least from a defensive standpoint, solved their third base problem with young Gary Scott at third. Easy inning for Wally Whitehurst in the Mets. It's still New York on top of the Padres after four. Six to one. And we'll be back after this from Sherwin Williams. In the first inning, Jeffries with an RBI single, an infield hit. The Padres tied it in the second. Scott Coolball driving in Thomas Howard. And then in the top of the third inning, all heck broke loose as Hubie Brooks hit a grand slam home run and Kevin McReynolds with an RBI single driving in Howard Johnson. And that's where we are. Six to one. New York over San Diego. And Greg Jeffries fouls one off of Rich Rodriguez. Rodriguez entering the game in the third inning, replacing Eric Nolte. 0 and 1 to Jeffries. Way inside, ball one, one and one. Change up. Lifted foul, a ball and two strikes now to Greg. You get the feeling that you expect Jeffries to break out and start hitting the ball. I look at him and I just see him swing and I can't believe that he isn't hitting better than he is. Goes after a bad ball there, one and two. He's not going to hit hitting at those pitches. But with the pressure off this spring, nobody really on his back. Nobody saying he's the wonder kind. And all those things, I thought he would really bounce away to a great start. And he's off to a very slow start. Batting only 196 coming into the game. He is one for one, however. It's two and two to Greg. Can't make it all up overnight. I mean, you got to, you got to. Take. Try to take one game mm -hmm. at a time. I know it's cliche-ish to, to say, but. Well, he lines one to left, so now two for two. And that was a perfect swing on a tough pitch. Right on the inside corner, a little short swing. The one thing you really look forward in the hitter. And he's got that short swing, and here he just puts the bat on the ball perfectly. Hey, you know, that rip cage muscle might have been a blessing in disguise. I know it sounds strange, but when you have a torso injury, a mild, superficial torso injury, you shorten your swing. You don't try to do too much because you can't. And that, that uh, really is, is part of the problem when you're going badly, is you try to do too much. You try to swing too hard. You don't stay within yourself and take that short, crisp swing. Hubie Brooks had that back in the third when he hit his first Grand Slam home run of the year. Way outside, one and one to Hubie. I know, I used to try to put what I felt was about an 80% swing on every pitch. I tried to, and I was able to do so, but not swing to full capacity. In other words, if you're playing golf, not try to hit a 300-yard drive. Just try to make good, solid contact and let the rest happen. Stay within yourself. Well, that's that's where all those cliches come from, and, and that's why the, the one thing I hate to hear is that this guy will go out and give you 120%. You know, it's the guys who don't try too hard. I mean, that's what staying within yourself really is, that controlled demeanor on the ball field, relaxed play. And the same thing applies when you're hitting. This one tapped foul. The other cliche which you hear all the time about pitchers is overthrowing, and it's yeah. the same thing, really. I mean, you try to throw it too hard, and it doesn't get there as fast. You got to stay within your rhythm, within your tempo, and then you got the whole thing wrapped up in a nutshell. 
You really can't extend yourself beyond your limit. Two balls, two strikes to Hubie Brooks. Greg Jeffries at first. Nobody out here in the fifth with the Mets on top, six to one. Nice play by Santiago, three and two. We'll see if Jeffries is sent by Buddy Harrelson, probably. Mike Cubbage, the third base coach over at first, Tom Spencer. There goes Jeffries. Drill the cool ball at third, and it'll be a double play. Hubie Brooks hit another bullet, but Jeffries an easy double play victim to away. Nothing you can do about that. Well, with the count three and two, Jeffries running with the pitch and dead to rights once the ball is caught. Cool ball making a fine catch, takes it in the air. And that is the 31st double play turned by the Padres this year. It ties them with the New York Mets for the most double plays in the National League. So a nice play by Scott Coolball, the third baseman. And the double play completed, and Howard Johnson takes ball one. Hojo walked, stole a base. Scored a run in the five run fifth. This ball hit deep to left field. Howard over near the line, and it's a foul ball by about four feet. Oh, Howard Johnson gets enough of it. But he's just a shade out in front as he takes it deep to left field, far enough to be out of the ballpark, but foul by about a four-foot margin. Johnson just missed a home run his first time up, so Hojo is locked in. He just misses another home run as he sends Bip Roberts, the center fielder, back near the track. So Hojo, with a home run his last two games, has just missed a couple tonight. Mets still leading six to one, middle of the fifth. We're back after this from AT&T. Got the express written consent of the New York Mets and Sterling Doubleday Enterprises and WWOR TV is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of the program, such as by charging admission for its showing, similarly prohibited. It's like that FedEx guy. Remember how, <laughs> how fast he used to read those things? <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the barn, <laughs> Paul Ferris has just grounded that ball foul in the count of strike two on the second baseman. Ferris worked in the walk in the three two pitch his first time up. Wally Whitehurst on the mound for the Mets. He has struck out five through his first four innings. And the fastball is topped to the shortstop side fielded perfectly by Jeffries as he gets the throw off running and he makes the play. <laughs> Kevin goes all the way across or I should say Greg goes all the way across the infield. Watch this play and watch what happens after he throws the ball to Tuffle. Now he makes a nice play and he keeps on going and he almost runs into Tuffle's throw. To second baseman Tommy Herr. Now there's the out. And then the throw by Tuffle almost hits Jeffries. And he has to get out of the way of the throw around the infield. I've never seen that. That had been a first. <laughs> Good play, though, by Greg Jeffries yeah. on the topper. And that'll bring up the pinch hitter, Kevin Ward. Ward batting 355 at Las Vegas this year before being brought up. He was in 23 ball games. Ward hitting 200 for the Padres so far, far this year. He's two for 10. Ward batting for the pitcher, Rodriguez. And he fouls that one off oh his boy. foot. I'm not, not laughing at, at Kevin and not laughing to see, but I mean, here you wait the whole game to get up to pinch hit, and on the second pitch, you hammer one off your foot.
This is enough to send Kevin Ward to the sick ward. Ward originally signed by the Phillies, released by the Phillies, signed by Oakland, and then drafted by the Padres in the minor league draft. From Lansdale, Pennsylvania. He lives in Coronado. Little island just off of the main part of the city of San Diego. Beautiful place to live. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous area. Isn't it? it certainly is. At one time you had to take the ferry boat over there to the island, and then they built a bridge. One ball, two strikes to count to Kevin Ward. Mets leading six to one. Two and two. Ward last year at Tacoma in the Pacific Coast League hit 297. And it's shot foul. Two balls and two strikes as Wally Whitehurst tries to pick up his second victory of the year, his first game on his birthday. He has lost one. And if he defeats the Padres, it will mark the first time he has beaten San Diego. Off the hands and right back to Whitehurst. Two men away. That's a tough at bat right there. I mean, you hammer one off your shin. And then you get jammed. So Wally got Kevin Ward in the shin and in the hands. Ouch. Doesn't have far to go home. So two men out. And that'll bring up Bip Roberts, who has struck out and grounded out. Kevin hurting from head to toe. He's limping back to his seat. <laughs> and his hands are ringing and his feet are hurting. Oh, guys. That's a tough at bat right there. He'll probably go home tonight and supper will be cold. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the 1 0 pitch. Padres losing by a score of 6 to 1 with a day game to follow tomorrow. It'll be Doc Gooden on the mound, Ed Whitson going for San Diego. This one grounded foul. Biff Roberts with a count of strike two. Roberts with a lifetime average against the Mets of 318. He's hit them well. Came into this game hitting 275 in the year. One and two. Hey, Rick Cerrone's doing a fine job with Whitehurst tonight. Coming inside to make that sinker away that much more effective. We like the way Cerrone and Charlie O'Brien call the games. Really have an idea back there. That is two and two. Rick last year with the Yankees. Picked up by the Mets as a free agent. A real plus for them. And it's a fastball that's fouled into the stands. So very late swing that keeps the count of two balls and two strikes. See that that's what you do. You you come inside so you can go away. You don't come inside to get them out, but you come inside to show the hitter that you will come inside, and that keeps that outside part of the plate effective in getting a hitter out. And the 2-2 pitch the curve this time, but it's in the dirt, and it's a full count, three and two. If you keep going away, away, away to a hitter, then away is no longer away because the hitter keeps leaning out over the plate and in effect brings that outside corner to him. And it's top foul. Three players at 300 or better with at least 40 extra base hits, 40 stolen bases. Two of those three players were MVPs last year. Ricky Henderson and Barry Bonds. The other, Bip Roberts. He is really a hidden talent. Bet your Bippy on that. You can bet your Bippy is right. 309 last year. 
And again, he fouls it off. He led the National League with 62 hits to the opposite field. Boggs led the major leagues with 81. And on artificial turf, he's the first player to hit 400 on artificial turf in 16 years. Of course, he plays on natural grass, <laughs> which is a little bit of a disadvantage. But remember that in case you have a rotisserie team that has artificial turf. And there's a ground ball to shirt, short. And a one, two, three inning. Seven in a row for Whitehurst. And the score at the end of five. It is the Mets six and the Padres one. Now here's a word from American Express. He's now in relief. He has a record of 0-1 with an earned run average of 7.80. He has had one save. He's worked 15 innings, given up 23 base hits. And Gardner will be working to Kevin McReynolds as a first batter. Kevin with an RBI and a base hit, one for two, and he has a check swing and a little ground ball hit out to the first base side. And McReynolds, an easy out. Mets leading six to one. And the feature blow in the ball game, a grand slam home run First by Hubie Brooks. That's scoring five runs in the third inning after leading one nothing and seeing the Padres tied at one one. Now the batter will be Tim Tuffle. Tuffle over two. He was robbed of an extra base hit and a fine catch by Thomas Howard, the left fielder, his last time up. That's six runs and eight hits. The Padres have one run on three. The first pitch, a call strike. Gardner, the Mets' 22nd round selection in the June 1982 draft, and he tries the curveball. One ball, one strike. He was traded to Boston with John Christensen, an outfielder, Calvin Chiraldi, a pitcher. Lachelle Traver, also an outfielder. And the big man in that trade, Bob Ojeda. For the Mets, he was one and three with one save. And a ground ball hit to the shortstop, Fernandez. And Tony's throw to first base gets tough. Two men away. And that'll bring up Rick Cerrone. Catcher Rick Sorrell. Well, City Hall in Newark should be a rousing time on Sunday afternoon. A statue of Rick Sorrell will be unveiled, put at Seton Hall, and the ultimate pa pirate will be the label on there. And Sorrell comes through with his second hit as he singles up the middle. Now two for three. Pirates of Seton Hall. Uh huh. His wife Michelle and his daughter Jessica will represent Rick, and Rick has said that that he wishes yeah, he could be there, but he is getting nice. representation from his family. Have a chance to see the statue on Mondays. That's a nice thing. Fourteen years in the major leagues. Cleveland, Toronto, the Yankees three times, the Red Sox. Doing a bang up job for the Mets, too. The Mets are going to pinch hit for Wally Whitehurst as Mackie Sasser comes up. Whitehurst leading in the ball game by a six to one margin. Whitehurst throwing 82 pitches. Sasser hitting 250 for the year as a pinch hitter. He's three for seven with a home run. I think this is a good move because uh, Wally, his last three outings were in long relief. His last start the 24th of April. And Sasser grounds it to the second base side. Paul Ferries has it. And the throw to first base retires the side. So a base hit given up by Gardner. One man left on base, and the score at the end of five and a half innings, the Mets six, and the Padres one. Now here's a word from the New York Daily News.
Pete Shorick in relief of Wally Whitehurst. Pete 2 and 0 on the year. He does have a save. So Pete Shorick, Whitehurst working five innings and leaving with a big bulge. Six to one ball game. Mets on top. And Shurik will be pitching to Tony Fernandez as his first batter. Tony 0 for 2. And the first pitch, a fastball, ball one. Whitehurst giving up only three hits, and he retired the last seven Padres to face him. And there's his strike again, the fastball, one ball, one strike. Whitehurst striking out five in five innings. One of them, Tony Fernandez, who also has granted that. I believe that's Wally's career high, too. And the fastball again, one and two. Of course, only his fifth major league start. White has the chance to even his record as a starting pitcher at two and two if he can get the victory here in tonight's game. Ground ball to third, Jeffries. Over to Tuffle. One out. That'll bring up Tony Gwynn, who has one of the three hits in the game for the Padres. Yep, last year he had two outings where his strikeout high was four against Montreal in September in Los Angeles back in May. So career high five strikeouts for Wally Whitehurst tonight. Gwynn with a single to left field his last time up one for two came into the game hitting 325 fifth in the National League. And he takes his strike. And he takes another strike. Two strikes to count. Win one of the toughest in baseball to strike out. Gets a curveball that time. One ball and two strikes. Chris Grin, Tony's younger brother, over with the Dodgers. And a ground ball to the first base side. Tuffle has it. Shuffles off to Shurik and two men away. First baseman. That'll bring up Fred McGriff, who is 0 for 2, also has struck out. That's a uh, not being able to contain McGriff. He came into this game 5 for 12 against the Mets with a home run. But so far, 0 for 2 in this game. McGriff has hit in 16 of his previous 18 ball games, hitting 409 over that period of time with eight home runs. Two balls, no strikes. And it's 3-0. and oh. We were talking in McGriff's last at bat about the fact that he is a flat-footed hitter. In other words, he does not strike. Very, very hard to do. And here's a pitch for... A strike in this three and one. You can try it, but it's very difficult to do. It takes practice and more practice. And it's hit hard, but it is a foul ball. Now, a lot of hitters take batting practice. They come out early and they just swing with the hands with the idea that. There it is. He just picks the foot up and puts it down in the same spot. But if you swing it like that in batting practice, what you're really doing is working on the fact that you won't overstride during the ball game. And this ball hit in the air to right. He just missed a home run. It'll stay in the ballpark. But it will come down eventually, and it does. <laughs> oh, it was up there. <laughs> So a one, two, three inning for Pete Churik. And the score at the end of six, the Mets six, the Padres won. And here's a word from American Airlines. 
of the seventh. A couple of San Diego Padre rooters as they're hoping that the Padres can get back in this ball game. The Mets are leading by a score of six to one. And coming in for the play-by-play, -play, Tim McCarver. You're just trying to pacify me, right? That's yeah, right. <laughs> Six to one, Met lead, and we were just visited by Eddie Lynch, who's the director of the minor league operations for the Padres. Eddie, now a lawyer. Wow. Eddie, you'll remember a pitcher for the Mets and the Chicago Cubs. He was always a clubhouse lawyer, so it's apropos. <laughs> you wait until he left before <laughs> yeah, he you didn't said that, don't, right? Don't, don't tell him I said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fastball is high to Coleman. Class guy, I'll tell you that. He was really a wonderful person to know and be with when he was with the Mets. Tell him I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Three balls and no strikes. Now somebody's going to take umbrage at that because you're not affirming what I'm saying. You're just sitting there with I'm that just smirk. Letting you go. <laughs> yeah, you're just sitting there. Let me bury myself. <laughs> <laughs> There's a high strike to Coleman, three and one. Six one Mets. Hubie Brooks a grand slam home run in the top of the third. Bulk of the scoring this evening. We're in the seventh. Wes Gardner, the third Padre pitcher, and it's three and two now to Coleman. Eddie just hired over the offseason when Joe McElvain came from the Mets. He thought Ed Lynch was the man for the job, and Ed, in his first year as the director of minor league operations for San Diego, and no doubt will someday be a the head man and organization in baseball very savvy guy sharp finished his law degree down at the University of Miami in Florida not Ohio well Coleman out on strikes throws the bat away heads for first but retreats and goes back to the Met dugout he thought it was a little outside one away Check it out the Macy's National League scoreboard. Chicago defeated Atlanta by a score of five to four. Hassemacher, the winning pitcher, his first win of the year. Cincinnati three, St. Louis one. Charlton, the winning pitcher, two and three in the year. Dibble got his ninth save. Pittsburgh six, Houston three. Zane Smith, the winner, he's now five and one. And it's the Dodgers six, Montreal nothing in the top of the fifth. Also on the schedule, Philadelphia. Leading San Francisco four to nothing that game in the top of the sixth inning. Coming in the a to action tonight, as you see Tommy Herr with the count, no balls and one strike. Philadelphia leading the National League in strikeouts. Not that. Wild pitches and strikeouts. The Cubs dropped into a tie for last place with the Phillies until they won today. The Phillies might stay right there in that tie as they lead in their game. Oh, look at this play. Oh, Griff can't pick it. So an infield hit for Tommy Herr. Well, this would have been on the highlights forever if this play had been made. Hernandez made a fantastic play and then threw the ball with a high arc over to first, and they had the runners. Tommy Herr would have been out, but McGriff can't hold the ball. It's thrown in the dirt, but the throw is as accurate as it can be from that difficult throwing position. Just a little bit short of the mark. What a play that would have been. There it is again. Mm. Greg Jeffries now two for two on the evening with an RBI and a run scored. Tommy Herr with his second hit. Ten hits now for the Mets. They have been banging the ball out consistently tonight. Base hit in every inning but the second when they were retired in order. Two balls and no strikes now to Greg Jeffries. Strike one.
fly ball left field and playable as Thomas Howard drifts back. Two outs here in the seventh. And checking out the American League scoreboard, the Yankees defeated California 7-1. Pascal Perez, his first one of the year. Big one right there. Boston beat Chicago to stay in first place. They defeated the White Sox 4-1. Pascal's brother, the loser in that game, Bolton the winner. Toronto 4, Kansas City 1. Seattle 2, Cleveland 1. Baltimore 6, Oakland 1. Minnesota 5, Milwaukee 1. Texas 4, Detroit 1. Hubie Brooks now. 6 to 1 here. Mets trying to even the series and the season series. They have lost two of three to San Diego. That's Seattle Ball Club, a half a game behind Oakland now, trying to finish the season for the first time in their history. Over 500. Two balls and a strike now to Hubie Brooks, who had his sixth career grand slam back in the third inning. Ground ball to short. Fernandez over to second baseman Paul Ferries for the third out. And the Mets go quietly here in the seventh inning. They might be tired. They have been hitting a lot of balls hard. And as a result on our GE line score, it's six to one New York. And we'll return right after this message. The one lead relieved by Pete Shorek in the sixth inning. And Shorek retired the Padres in order. Benito Santiago leads it off. Outside, ball one. Benito has struck out and grounded to first. Ball two, two and oh. Popped up in the infield. Shortstop Howard Johnson under it. That's four in a row now, retired by. Shorick. And remember, Whitehurst had retired seven in a row before he left. So 11 Padres in a row have gone down. And Thomas Howard batting right-handed now. Takes fastball outside and low. Pete Shorick only 21 years old. In the clubhouse in San Francisco the other day, I was watching the basketball game. Seemed to be very interested in it. And I asked if he played basketball. He, being of 6'5", Greg Jeffries almost lost that in the light, but he makes the play in the lights. Two outs here in the seventh. And Pete told me that he was a basketball player and had some offers to junior colleges, no major college. Greg Jeffries almost lost that ball in the lights, but made the play anyway. Well, he really does fight it off, as you can see, that ball right in there as it took that high hop, bouncing up high enough for the lights to come into the background. But he made the play anyway. Billy Lowe's can lose a ball in the sun. <laughs> Greg Jeffries can lose it in the lights, right? Billy Lowe's in the World Series lost a ground ball in the sun. Scott Kubal takes a ball. It's one and one to Scott, who has driven in the only run of the game, the Padres, back in the second inning. We're in the seventh, six to one, New York. Good curveball. He's got a good curve. Kubal looks like he's a good-looking hitter. He has a nice compact swing and a good stance. Nothing's really come out of his career yet. 
This one drilled by Greg Jeffries at third base. And Kubal has a double. Fan interfered with the ball down there. It was a double. Any way you want to slice it. So the first hit for the Padres off Pete Shorick. And that'll bring up the second baseman, Paul Ferries. Number 23, second baseman, Paul Ferries. Well, he gets this ball on the inside and drills it right by Jeffries, who was playing in with two men out. Don't really understand why he was playing even with a bag in that spot. One of the fans jumping on the field to retrieve it, but it's a two base hit. Doug Harvey, the third base umpire, saying Browns rule double. Paul Ferries pops it up, shallow right field. Tommy Hur with the arm up, and he makes the catch. Padres fail to score. The Mets pitching and hitting have been strong tonight, and that's why they lead 6-1 to one after 7. And we'll be back after this from Bud Light. There have been some glum faces here in San Diego tonight because the Mets are on top, 6-1. to one. One wonders what would drive those two gentlemen to put bags over their heads. They better bag it. It's not that good an act. Howard Johnson now. Beach balls obviously very popular out here because we're near the beaches. That's a big beach ball. Ball has looked almost that big to Howard Johnson the last three days. Two home runs. He's just missed a couple this evening. It's two balls and no strikes now to Hojo. Outside and high, ball three. Three and oh. Johnson walks on four straight balls thrown by Wes Gardner. He's the leadoff base runner here in the eighth inning with the Mets on top six to one and that'll bring up Kevin McReynolds who is one for three an RBI single in the third. And for those of you who are into basketball the Golden State Warriors are leading the Lakers by 104 to 100 with a minute and 44 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Plenty of time. Lakers lead that series three to one. So Golden State trying to stay alive. No balls and one strike to Kevin McReynolds. Ball two. Well, was, ball one, one and one. Lasorda's remark when Will Chamberlain came down to meet him and talk with him, he says Chamberlain's his biggest fan. <laughs> Probably right there. Inside to McReynolds. Oh, you have one Arkansan facing another one. Wes Gardner from Benton, Arkansas. Kevin McReynolds from North Little Rock. Benton about 15 miles from Little Rock. Two duck hunters facing one another. McReynolds actually owns a duck club. Yeah. He? Part of his contract from what I understand. Money set aside from. For a duck club over near Joyner Arkansas I believe. Joyner Stuttgart. That's at Arkansas Flyway right near Memphis. A lot of rice fields over there. This one foul back. Still two and two. But McReynolds, an avid duck hunter. And I believe Gardner is too. I joined a duck club in Palm Springs. Phil Harris was a charter member. 
When it was all over, I figured that I saw maybe one duck. It cost something like $500 to see one. <laughs> well, if Scott Coolball doesn't duck, makes a fine play. Coolball putting on quite a show for the fans here. He's been a one-man show, I might add. Nothing else has really happened as far as the Padres are concerned on the positive side. Well, this is ticketed to be a base hit. Something McReynolds needs badly with his bad start, but Coolball robs him as he gets the force play at second. Fine play there. A little cheating at second by Ferries in the neighborhood of second base as he gets the call from second base umpire Gary Darling. What a good play by Coolball. Tim Tuffle now, 0 for 3 on the evening. Ball hit hard to left field, but Thomas Howard there, and Tuffle slams his bat down. That's the second one he's hit like that to the left fielder. Actually, the first one was hit even harder and a tougher catch. I certainly understand the frustration. Timmy not being able to play a lot this year, and when you do get a chance, you want to take advantage of the playing opportunity. So Tim Tuffle obviously not happy. He's hit the ball well a couple of times, as Ralph said. Here's Rick Cerrone. Rick, a good night. He's two for three, and he grounds it right side. Second baseman Ferries throws him out. Still 6-1 to one Mets, middle of the eighth. We'll be back after this from Citibank. Up again. Darren Jackson will be the pinch hitter for Wes Gardner, and he fouls it back. Darren, formerly with the Chicago Cubs. When the market has a day like it did this afternoon, what are they... People talk about it like it was a human being. You know, they say the stock market was tired today. Didn't perform well. It didn't feel good. You know, they they personalize it. No balls and two strikes to Darren Jackson. So the market was indeed sick today. Down 37 points. Unless you're playing short. Howard Johnson playing short for the Mets, and the curveball misses to Darren Jackson. Six to one Mets. Curveball gets him. Darren Jackson thought it was outside, but first strikeout now for Pete Shorick. Well, Whitehurst and Shorick have certainly put on a show tonight. Combined for six strikeouts. This is a curveball that comes in from, well, I guess El, El Centro. El Centro, right. Uh -huh. El Centro, what, about 50 miles to the east, of, east here. of here? Bip Roberts now the batter. Bip 0 for 3. He fouls it back. Desert country, isn't it, El Centro? It right surely there? is. Couldn't get hot there, does it? <laughs> like 120 <laughs> degrees. Big farm area there. They really grow all that alfalfa and stuff. It's... I think Doug Harvey is actually from El Centro. He oh, now lives right? in San Diego, yeah. This curveball outside. It's two balls and a strike to Bip Roberts. Bob Elliott. Great ball player in the National League, and now he also managed here in San Diego in the minor leagues. There's Doug Harvey from El Central. Bob Elliott, one time the MVP of the National League, 1947. Popped up right side, and Tommy Herr makes the play. Good pitching can make a lot of offenses appear to be listless, and that is the case of the Mets tonight. Padres with only one hit since the third inning. And that one hit led to nothing, the only base runner since the third inning. I think that's really the secret. No walks. Those walks, as Frankie Frisch had, caused a lot of trouble. 
No walk since the third, I'm talking uh -huh. about. Only one walk in the ball game, and that was to Paul Ferries in the second inning as Tony Fernandez now has the Kent 0-1. Both Whitehurst and Short staying ahead of the hitters. That looked like a split finger that's low. 1-1. One one. See he throw that? I, I, I don't that. know, but I mean, that's what that pitch looked like. I haven't seen him throw it. High ball two, two and one to Fernandez. Strike two, two and two. That pitch unhittable right there. If you can put the ball in those spots, you're ahead of the game. Just outside, three and two to Fernandez. He'll do it again. Fernandez, one of many, many shortstops from San Pedro de Macorís little town in the Dominican Republic that has spawned so many major leaguers and none more popular down there than Tony Fernandez known affectionately to his countrymen as Cabeza probably because he's head and shoulders above all of the other shortstops that that town has produced and they have been many Not only shortstops, but Pedro Guerrero, Joaquin Andujar, Cabeza walks. I guess you could say Cabeza to Primera Besa. And he's there with two outs and Tony Gwynn the batter. Tony one for three on the evening. Six to one, New York on top. Ten hits for the Mets, four for the Padres. Inside. Tony with a home run in last night's game. A home run in the first inning off David Cohn. His first since last July 15th. Win jammed and Johnson makes the play. Still six to one New York after eight. We'll be back after this from Bud Light. Mike Maddox, the pitcher for San Diego. He has a record of two and one with an earned run average of 3.63. He's picked up one save. He is the brother of Greg Maddox of the Chicago Cubs. And he'll be the new pitcher for the Padres. Pete Shorek will be the batter to lead it off here in the ninth inning. Oh, and one to Pete. So if Shorey can complete the ninth inning, he will be credited with his second save of the year. Even though the score is six to one, the Mets ahead by five. If you complete the game and work at least three innings, you are credited with the save. And that would be the case if, if Pete does that. He lifts one to center field, and Bip Roberts is there, and he makes the play. One away here in the ninth. And after every game this season, points will be awarded to Mets pitchers for the AT&T Long Distance Award. Here's how it works. For every inning pitch, you get a point. You also get credit for fractions of a pitcher is credited with a complete game. He gets a bonus point at the end of the season. The man on top will win the AT&T Long Distance Award. And Doc Gooden's leading by one inning over Viola. Gooden goes tomorrow. 
Vince Coleman now. Vince has two singles and two strikeouts to his credit and discredit this evening. He's two for four. Also a stolen base, his 21st of the year to extend his major league lead in that department. And it's one and one to Vince Coleman. Six to one, New York on top. Wally Whitehurst and Pete Shorek have throttled the Padre hitters this evening. The splitter is low, two balls and a strike. Kiner's corner coming up this evening. Following our telecast, two and two to Benny. Ralph with all the scores of all the games. Those few that are in progress. And a quick glance shows only Texas, Los Angeles, and San Francisco hosting games that are in progress. As Coleman goes down on strikes. Two outs here in the ninth inning, and Tommy Herr comes up. Tommy, a good night. Two for four with a run scored. Ground ball, right side. Great play by Ferries. Throws to Maddox for the out. Mm. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Good defensive ball game tonight. A fine play by Paul Ferries to end the ninth. Second time that Tommy Herr has been picked. We go to the bottom of the ninth. We'll be back after this from Macy. Fred McGriff leading it off here in the ninth, and he fouls off the first pitch. And Ralph, you were saying that it looked like that uh, ring finger on Cerrone's left hand that could have been hurt there. McGriff takes strike two. 0 oh, and two to Fred McGriff. Six to one Mets here in the ninth. And that finger hurt, actually broken by Doc Gooden in spring training. Oh, those hands take a beating. Outside, ball one. One of the big reasons that catchers don't hit for high averages or for power. Your hands are always sore. And since you have to hold the bat with your hands, makes sense. Only, but Ernie Lombardi Led the league in hitting twice. Who His else? hands There's were one so more, big. I believe. His hands were so big it didn't make any difference. Uh, hard graze, bubbles, hard graze. Yep. Pop up in foul territory, and Jeffrey's over. One away here in the ninth inning. Only two outs left for the Padres. Six to one, New York. And baseball fans team up with the New York Mets and Rotary International to strike out hunger in New York. Please fill a bag with canned foods and bring it to the Mets Cubs game on Thursday, May 23rd. It'll all be taken and handled and used for good stead. Yep, a virtuous project, no question. Benito Santiago, the batter. Santiago has been quiet, as have most of the Padre hitters tonight. Only four hits for San Diego. Six to one, New York, and Santiago fouls it back. We'll be back on the air on Sunday afternoon, 4.30 New York time. Dodgers and the Mets. Dodgers playing the Mets two games and splitting them at New York. Daryl Strawberry's return. Well, what a story that was. That first night, Strawberry with a two-run homer. Dodgers coming from a six-to-nothing deficit. And then Strawberry making the last out against John Franco in the ninth inning as the Mets won at six to five. What a script. 
Two balls and a strike now to Benito Santiago. Grounder toward third. Nice play, Jeffries. Two outs here in the ninth inning. You get a feeling that every time Strawberry plays against the Mets this year, it's going to be like that, huh? At anticipation. Well, he's had a real tough time, except he did fairly well against the Mets with that home run. He also singled in the second ball game, but overall, he's really having a struggle. But Strawberry against the Mets has that extra something going. And it was dramatic that first time he oh, came boy. back to Shea. I'll say. Thomas Howard now scored the only Padre run way back in the second inning. The Mets with one in the first and then the third inning. Blowing starter Eric Nolte out of the tank with a grand slam home run by Hubie Brooks and an RBI single by Kevin McReynolds. And that's really the story of this game. Six to one New York. And this should do it. Vince Coleman easy play and Pete Shorick earning his second save of the year giving up only one hit and two base runners in his four innings Wally Whitehurst the winner so two young pitchers really doing the job on the Padre hitters and that's the story the Mets remain two games behind the Pittsburgh Pirates who won their game in Houston tonight Ralph and I back with a wrap up and remember Kiner's Corner to follow right after this from Budweiser. Wally Whitehurst and Pete Shorick making due tonight by giving up only four hits to the San Diego Padres and the Grand Slam home run by Hubie Brooks. And that was the real story tonight as the Mets beat the Padres six to one. You know, it's very difficult for a pitcher not to pitch in rotation as a starting pitcher. And Whitehurst out of rotation for a while because of the schedule and the days off and what have you. Came back, pitched better than I've ever seen him pitch here in the ball game today, going five innings. I guess the reason why they did take him out was because he hasn't been in as a starter for quite some time, and he really had good stuff. His last start was April the 24th, so it's been uh, about three weeks since he started, and to have that type of control is probably the reason he's our Budweiser star <laughs> of the game. Wally Whitehurst with his second win of the season, his third win for his major league career and you know who's probably as happy as anybody tonight somebody down in uh, the south deep Roslyn south. Roslyn Olivier Whitehurst <laughs> and that'll be her name uh, as we mentioned Wally Whitehurst recently engaged and he will be married after the season's over. And I'm sure Buddy Harrelson has got to be pretty happy, too, with that performance tonight. Well, after last night, he kind of got blown out of the ball game last night. And, of course, he's got good and going tomorrow. So all things should be very, very nice for Buddy tonight. He should be able to sleep quietly. I would think so. Well, quietly and quickly because the Mets have a game at 1 tomorrow. That's right. With Doc Gooden on the mound, we'd like to remind you the final score of the ball game: the Mets 6 and the Padres 1. New York Mets baseball 91 has been brought to you by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. By nobody beats the whiz. Home entertainment centers for everything in home electronics, music, and movies. Nobody beats the whiz. And by New York Telephone, who reminds you that we're all connected. By your local area Midas dealers. Remember, nobody beats Midas. Nobody. By RC Cola. By Macy's, we're part of your life. And by the New Jersey Bell Yellow Pages, no other book can match it. New Jersey Bell, a Bell Atlantic company. Some of our guests will receive Atari Portfolio. The computer that fits in your hands, takes notes, keeps important addresses, do spreadsheets, schedule appointments and more. The Atari Portfolio, available at your local dealers. Also a portable compact disc player from Kenwood. And for people who demand superior communication technology wherever they go, Kenwood introduces it. And it's new handheld cellular telephone, the KMP H700. Be with us again on Sunday, May 19th, when the Mets take on the Los Angeles Dodgers at 4 p.m. New York time. Now stay tuned for Kiner's Corner with our special guest, the winner of today's ball game, Wally Whitehurst.
Mets Baseball 91 is produced and directed by Jeff Mitchell. Associate producer, Steve Obom. The announcers on the preceding telecast were approved and contracted for by Sterling Doubleday Enterprises. Our executive producer is Rick Miner. This has been a presentation of WWOR-TV, Universal 9 Sports. you by Budweiser, the king of beers with that clean, crisp, cold taste. Nothing beats a Bud. And by NatWest Banks, raising the standards of banking. And by Mitsubishi, bringing you a full line of award-winning automobiles. See them all at your Mitsubishi Motors dealers. Well, hi, everybody, uh, and welcome to Kiner's Corner from San Diego. Our special guest will be Wally Whitehurst, who pitched that masterful game when five innings was the winning pitcher in the ball game. We'll also be taking a look at the highlights of the ball game and the scoreboard of all the games in the National and the American Leagues right after this message from Budweiser. Our special guest is Wally, and Wally, congratulations on a very fine pitching performance especially after not being in the starting rotation. It really has to make you feel good. Well, I was concerned about uh, my last start was uh, the second game in Philadelphia, and uh, then I went to the bullpen over the homestand, and I haven't pitched in about 10 days, so I was concerned about uh, if I felt too strong, and I was, uh, once I went out and warmed up, uh, I did feel strong, but I just tried to concentrate on uh, keeping control of myself and keeping the ball down, and... Uh, establishing in right away and I thought I did that pretty well had good velocity it looked like you were throwing the ball very well and you had that good curveball as always well you know pitching 10 days you tend to have pretty good velocity uh, that last inning I was I was grunting every pitch I felt like Nolan Ryan the only difference <laughs> between me and him is he throws about 10 miles an hour harder well you pitched a very strong start you worked one two three in the first and then one two in the second then things got a little bit tough for you the Mets are leading one nothing you gave up a base hit to Thomas Howard and then he stole second, and then Scott Coolball singled the center field to tie the ball game up. And then after that, a walk. Were you getting a little nervous at that point? Not, not really nervous. Uh, both players hit, hit pretty good pitches. Uh, I was just trying to get ahead with uh, Thomas Howard, and he went the other way with it. And then uh, I felt I did fall behind to uh, Scott Coolball, and I uh, had to come in on three and two count. And uh, you know, just hoping he hit it at somebody, and unfortunately for me and for us, that uh, he hit it up the middle. And it went for the base hit that tied up the ball game, and then you settled down and gave up only one base hit after that. He struck out five in the ball game. That's your high in Major League Baseball, and uh, also walked only one. And a real good performance all the way around. But uh, the only thing we say good about your hitting, you did sacrifice well once. I didn't look good up there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Struck out your first time, but other than that, everything was fine. Everything after that went smooth. Well, Wally, congratulations on your second win in the major leagues. And, of course, your first game in your birthday, but you can't wait every year for a victory. No, if I do that, <laughs> I won't get that many wins. All right, Wally, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll be talking to you a little bit later on. Thanks, Ron. And we'll be back with more right after this message from Mitsubishi. Well, the Mets win it by a score of 6-1. to one. These are the highlights of the ball game. Jeffries drove in the first run of the ball game. Coleman had singled, stolen second base, and then moved over to third in a fly ball to right field by Tommy Herr. On the infield base hit, the Mets take the lead one to nothing. Didn't last too long as the Padres came back to tie it up. Cool boss, singled to center field and drives in Howard. Howard had singled and stolen second base, and that made it a 1-1 ball game in the bottom of the second inning. But then Hubie Brooks took care of the ball game as he hits a grand slam home run, and the Mets lead it by a score of 5-1 for Hubie Brooks. It was his seventh grand slam in his major league career, his fifth home run of the year, and he now has 13 runs batted in. 
And then McReynolds follows with a single to center field to drive in Howard Johnson. Howard had walked, stolen second base, and that made it a 6-1 to one ball game. Sure, it came in to relieve Whitehurst, and he picks up the final out of the ball game on a fly ball to center field. And the ball caught by Coleman. It was hit by Thomas Howard, and the Mets win it by a score of 6-1. to one. And we'll be back with the scores of the other games right after this message from Dad West Banks. Well, the Mets won it by a score of 6-1, to one, checking out the other scores in both the National League and the American League. Chicago defeated Atlanta by a score of 5-4 to four in that ball game. Osamaker was a winning pitcher. It was his first win of the year. He's lost none. The losing pitcher was Kent Mercer, and he's now 1-2, and two, a save for Lee Smith, and it was his ninth save of the year. Dawson, a home run in that ball game. It was his eighth home run of the year. Cincinnati over St. Louis. Up to the plate and become a part of the hottest hobby investment of the night. Now available, the all-new Hot Off the Press 1991 Collector Showcase Series of Upper Deck Baseball Cards from Great American Pastime. Upper Deck cards are rated best by experts. Each collector showcase volume contains 125 deluxe glossy player cards, the exclusive Great American Pastime binder, 14 protective plastic sleeves, and a certificate of original ownership and authenticity suitable for framing. And that's not all. You'll also receive an informative collector's guide and a history of sports card collecting. There are five different collector showcase volumes, 625 cards in all, Purchase one volume for only $29.95. Or order four now and receive the fifth volume plus 10 team holograms absolutely free. Start your collection today. To order, call 1-800-327-2500 or send a check to this address. 